28th of April 2015 marks the centenary of the founding of the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. Back in 1915, Churchill called this group These Dangerous Women. This documentary brings together peace activists and young volunteers to find out who these women were and how they tried to stop World War I. In July 1914, the women were aware that the political situation in Europe was deteriorating. And they were very concerned about this. And Rosika Schwimmer, who was a press officer in the Office for the International Women's Suffrage Alliance, got together with Millicent Fawcett, who was British president, and Krista Macmillan, who was the secretary for the international organization. And they wrote a letter called a manifesto, Women's Manifesto. And they delivered this to all the embassies and all the government offices in London, the ministers in London, um, in July. But I'm afraid it didn't have much effect, <laughs> any effect at all, really. There was the conference then in August, the 4th of August, um, when the women met um, to discuss suffrage, but ended up talking about war quite a lot and how none of them wanted this war. And yet it seemed, as one woman said, like a plague of measles. It was unavoidable. It was coming at them. That was the 4th of August when, of course, that night at midnight, the war was declared. In January, Crystal, as Secretary of International Women's Suffrage Alliance, sent out letters to all the different um, countries um, inviting women to attend a Congress as individual women. Um, and Dr. Jacobs in Holland called a meeting there in February. And four women went from Britain to that meeting to discuss resolutions, prepare resolutions for the Congress and when it, when it would happen. So in February, they decided that they would hold it in April. So not, not very far in the future. So Crystal then came and the other women came back to Britain. They helped organize um, committees all over Britain that supported this um, idea of a Congress in, in Holland. She then um, went back to The Hague at the beginning of April to help with the organization of the Congress. Well, I've come from Britain um, to organize the International Women's Peace Congress, uh, which is going to take place in April, so in two months' time. Uh, we're expecting 180 women to come from Britain um, I'm organising this with uh, Annette Jacobs and Crystal McMillan. We're hoping that we're finally going to have a voice and that we will eventually be given the right to vote. And this is a movement that is spread across Europe. It's the 9th of April, 1915. Today is the second meeting of the Manchester branch of the British Committee for the International Women's Congress at The Hague. We're expecting a lot of people. We want to elect delegates to go to The Hague at the end of April. 
This means applying to the government for passports. This means going over to The Hague to meeting with our sisters in Germany and Austria and France and some of the other belligerent countries. And we're trying hard, aren't we, Ms. Reddish, to get these girls into the unions yes. so that they have a voice. Yes. I think the voice of the women who work in the factories is essential. Yes. We have to reach out to everybody. It's an adventure, but it's also terribly important to stand up and make a stand, this stand, this stand against killing each other. And even if the other councillors in Manchester City Council cannot really bear me to be saying that, I shall continue to say it. At that time, you didn't have a passport, generally. You had to apply for a passport for every time you travelled, and you had to inform the Foreign Office where you were going and why you were going. Crystal um, got permission to go in April, um, the beginning of April. There were 180 other British women wanted to go to the Congress, and they applied for their passports. But the Foreign Office felt this was a bit not, not a good thing to be doing. They didn't want so many British women going abroad to a point that was so close to the centre of the war. The women were aghast, you can guess. Um, so Catherine Marshall, who was the parliamentary officer for International Women's Suffrage Alliance, um, and a very able uh, political negotiator, she set off to interviewed Mr McKenna, who was the uh, appropriate minister, and got him to agree that he would give passports for 24 of the more sensible women. <laughs> Salford. I'm a long-time suffragist. I don't believe in violent methods to get the vote. I haven't been as involved in the campaign locally as my colleague Miss Ashton because I've been spending my time campaigning for union representation for girls that work in the mills. Well, I'm uh, the first woman councillor ever elected to Manchester City Council and I've been very much involved in the suffrage movement and I've been convinced that we should take a stand on peace, that we cannot allow this war to continue. I'm Sarah Reddish, and I'm very anxious about travelling because I've never really left Bolton, but I know that it's very important to go where we're going. But at present, I'm worried about crossing the sea, and I wished we could go by land, but they tell me we have to go in a boat. I'm a Christian, I'm a pacifist, I'm a preacher. In fact, um, my career as a preacher seems to have been uh, more successful, I have to say, within the women's movement than it is within the Church of England. I would like to see the ordination of women, but I don't know how long we will have to wait for that to happen. I'm going to The Hague like Miss Reddish, because I think women of all social classes in this country are united by a wish to stop this dreadful slaughter. Representing Mary Shipshanks, who in 1913 was invited by Jane Addams to become the secretary, I think it was, of the International Women's Suffrage Alliance. She took a very principled view of the war. She was totally against war, she was totally against armaments. The argument that Mary Sheepshanks was making was that women bore the brunt of war. They were the ones whose sons were dying. Uh, as she wrote in her uh, journal, um, it was the women who had to bind up the wounds of the fallen and the, the dying. And so she was um, totally opposed to armaments. Her main aim and her main campaign was to settle disputes in a reasonable way and not through fighting. And that was why she was one of the, the women 
who was, were prepared to go to The Hague for the international conference. I'm portraying Helena Swanick, who was very interesting. Helena lectured extensively all over um, Scotland, all over England, and was very much accepted by the working class, who said, you're saying what we've been thinking, we just didn't know how to say it. Um, she was completely against armed conflict and really just believed that everyone should disarm. Um, she said, if you're preparing for peace by preparing for war, then you're going about it the wrong way. I'm representing Emily Leaf. Um, she was uh, born in about 1870 up at Crown Point, which is up at Streatham and Norwood, and she came from a large family. Um, her grandfather was a merchant. Her grandfather had been involved in temperance. They'd supported the local church. They were very willing to put their funds into not just a life of leisure, but supporting local and poorer people. Some books seem to suggest that she had a good friendship with Catherine Marshall. Um, and that might have been the point, the, 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 one of the things that had brought her in contact with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom. But she's still involved uh, years later with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom and then also the Feed the Famine Council after the war. So she does care, she's very interested in it, but um, why exactly she is here, we're not quite sure. I'm representing Mrs Crossfield, who's from a Cambridge, uh, well, she's a Quaker and she's living in Cambridge with her husband, Albert, and together they've spent a lifetime um, going out and travelling widely to relieve the suffering of others, but um, particularly in 1914. She's been quite recently to Holland um, to uh, relieve the suffering of the refugees. With the Quaker ethos, um, absolutely determined, really, to, to oppose war and uh, make sure that there could be a, a, a legitimate peace at the end of it, not, not to cause further conflict. So that's why she's, she's on her way now, hopefully, to the Congress. Um, I'm Lucy Dean Streetfield, and I've really had quite a lot of experience of wartime um, and what it does to people. When I went out to South Africa, I went on the commission, I was the secretary, and they sent out a commission to look into the details of what was happening in those uh, concentration camps. So what I would very much like to see is a, a, an internationally agreed method of sorting out disputes, really. I'm re representing Mrs Jane White from Edinburgh and she was a really incredible woman. She uh, went over to Palestine in 1906 and she met a man named Abdul Baha in prison there and he was a spiritual leader of the Baha'i faith. And when she came back to Edinburgh, she basically couldn't stop talking about him and singing his praises. And she's credited with being one of the first Baha'i Christians. One of her sons, Robert, died during the war, um, just months after the peace conference took place. But I think she really felt that it was important to promote a positive message of togetherness rather than division. And I think she was really impassioned by the Baha'i faith to sort of travel down to London. Well, I'm representing Mina Benson Hubbard Ellis and uh, she was a, a Canadian, in fact. I feel that she was someone who got a passport, something according to her status, and that probably held very strongly because of the 180 women who wanted to go to The Hague, the 24, we know they were chosen by civil servants because they were approved of by the government. There is a quotation about uh, we must have, in the end, they didn't want the women to go, but we must have British women there if there's going to be German women at The Hague. And I think that is how she came to go. Um, and, uh, you know, that's how I've come to be going to Tilbury. I'm Catherine Marshall, and I with Mrs. Hills have worked very hard to get permits and passports for the women to get there to The Hague in time for the Congress on the 28th. What happened 
was that naval war kind of escalated. There was a tit for tat going on between German government and British government about how many ships were safe, you know, whether ships flying a neutral flag were safe or ships carrying food that could be sent to Germany were definitely not safe. This ended with Winston Churchill as Minister of War deciding that, that they would shut the North Sea and the English Channel to all shipping. So just as the women were getting traveling to London to get down to Tilbury, to get on the ferry. All ferries, all commercial travel was finished, shut down. And there were ferries before this date and there were ferries after this date, but this particular two weeks, there were no ferries. The ferry did not go that week and they missed the Congress completely. Congress was a great success. Although only three British women were able to attend, we did get over 1,000 women from all across Europe. Crystal and Catherine Courtney, of course, were already at The Hague. And Emmeline Pettick Lawrence had been lecturing um, on peace issues all over America. And so she came with the American party. Crystal, of course, was one of the main organizers of, of the resolutions. They took written resolutions from all kinds of countries. They took resolutions from being sent in by committees, been sent in by individuals, and were raised on the floor of the Congress. And they worked half the night making composite resolutions and deciding which resolutions they would put forward. The first one was the most problematic. It is, expresses its sorrow at the bloodshed um, and urges political leaders to, to all in their power to look for a negotiated settlement. But there were three issues that she named that had to be present in that resolution. One, end the bloodshed. Two, negotiate, start negotiations. And three, negotiate with justice for everyone. There was absolutely no point in having a, a peace at any price. Resolution number 17 is, is about um, women being involved in peace negotiations. Um, and it's very interesting that we're still not there yet, are we? Wolf is still trying to negotiate, trying to get the Syrian women involved in the peace negotiations in Syria instead of just the military men. We created the Women's International League and became the British section of the International Committee for Permanent Peace. They'd almost finished the Congress when Rosika Schwimmer got up and said, these words are fine, but what are we going to do? And she suggested, that they go and visit all the heads of state with these resolutions that they'd spent three days putting together. Jane Adams, who was the president, expressed doubts about the wisdom of all this. But Rosika was a very good speaker and she stood up and she swayed the Congress and they all voted that this is a good plan. The committee then accepted gracefully that that was the will of the Congress and they elected five women and they were asked to go to every country in Europe in the middle of the war and speak to every political leader. I really believe that international cooperation is the way forward to make an end to the war, to stop the war and to finally get some peace around the world. Krista was one of the five elected. They were very wise. The women from the belligerent countries uh, the envoys, they went to the neutral countries and the women from the neutral countries, they visited the belligerent countries. And so they talked peace and just settlement of the war to both belligerent and neutral countries.
Jane Adams, the president of the Congress, and Dr. Jacobs from Holland, um, they traveled through Germany, Italy, Vienna, Budapest, Bern, Paris, and the other team um, visited Copenhagen, Christiania in Norway, um, Stockholm, Petrograd, and back to The Hague. Jane Adams came to London with Dr. Jacobs, and they met with um, Prime Minister Asquith and with uh, Lord Grey, um, both of whom were sympathetic to the cause and stated that they would not be offended by a conference of, called by neutral countries. And then Jane Adams went off early back to the States and interviewed President Wilson, who was sympathetic, but wouldn't do anything until he judged the time to be right. Two of the envoys, Jane Adams and Emily Balch, were each awarded the Nobel Peace Prize. They described their journeys in the book Women at the Hague, the Women's International Congress and its results. This is from Emily Balch's chapter. What was planned as a comparatively formal presentation of the resolutions of our Congress developed into something more than this. Never again must women dare to believe that they are without responsibility because they are without power. Public opinion is power. Strong and reasonable feeling is power. Determination, which is twin sister of faith or vision, is power. When our unaccustomed representatives knocked on the doors of the chancelleries of Europe, there was not one but opened. They were received gravely, kindly, perhaps gladly by 21 ministers. The presidents of two republics, a king and the pope, all apparently recognized without argument that an expression of public opinion of a large group of women had every claim to consideration in questions of war and peace. What these women actually did in 1915 is it should be in every history book. We're about to present a letter at 10 Downing Street to the Prime Minister David Cameron. And this letter uh, echoes the message that women in 1914 sent to their Prime Minister to try and stop the beginning of the war then. And we are saying the same message as they had, which is negotiation, not war. Get round and discuss the issues so that you don't have to take up arms. <laughs>